Um, well, yes. So thanks again to everyone um, for joining us this afternoon. Afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, seniors and senior hunger and specifically and how we can um, work towards combating that through the SNAP program. Um, and I have a lot of information to cover, so I'm going to try to keep moving along at a pretty good clip um, while hopefully being able um, to, to give you all of the information that you need. And just so you know, I know Rachel mentioned this, we are recording this webinar and my slides will be available on the RHI website following the webinar. It'll probably be um, sometime next week. So if you are taking notes and trying to capture things, don't worry. This will be available um, after the webinar if you would like to refresh any of the information. Um, so yes, my name is Elizabeth Weaver. I'm the SNAP Outreach Coordinator at the Montana Food Bank Network. Um, and a little bit about us. We are the only statewide food bank in Montana. Um, and we work to end hunger in Montana through food acquisition and distribution, education, and advocacy. Um, through food distribution, we work with approximately 150 partner agencies across the state. This ranges from food pantries to senior centers to soup kitchens to youth homes to boys and girls clubs, et cetera. Um, and then we also work in the policy side, um, kind of the program or department where I'm housed, on advocacy and education and outreach, um, really working with school programs as far as breakfast or summer food sites, working on SNAP outreach and application assistance, um, and working with all of the um, federal programs as well, such as TANF and TFAP and so forth, um, and kind of all of the facets that relate to food insecurity um, and the policies of um, that the government and both state and federal have kind of um, procured to uh, work to combat those things. And that went the wrong way. So a few um, facts about senior hunger is there are 10.2 million seniors, um, and that's nearly one in six that face the threat of food insecurity. Um, I'm not going to read all these numbers, but some of the ones that stick out to me are that there are 10,000 baby boomers um, that turn 65 every day from now until 2030. Um, that's an astronomical number of folks. Um, and by 2025, seniors are projected to compromise more than 30% of the population in 42 months. Counties. The largest increase we're seeing in seniors, um, and actually that have large senior populations right now, are mostly in eastern Montana. Um, and so, food insecurity is a very is a very big issue um, in in the state, and especially among seniors. Um, food insecure seniors are more likely, although many of these are applicable to anyone who's experiencing food insecurity, to have lower cognitive functioning. Um, Abilities, they experience weight loss, chronic disease, it can exacerbate things like diabetes, heart issues, blood pressure issues, so forth. They have loss of bone mass and muscle tissue. Um, it increases any health problems that can also lead to higher medical costs. Um, as we know, like if you uh, don't have very good, um, you know, bone mass or experiencing like osteoporosis and you fall, you can break your arm, break your leg, break your hip, all of those things. And it negatively impacts the ability of seniors to care for themselves and live independently. Um, and this is a huge, huge issue. Um, higher medical costs further reduce you know, the ability of seniors to afford adequate nutritious foods. And sometimes having lack of access to nutritious foods also can exacerbate their higher medical costs for meeting the medicines um, and doctor visits that they need. Um, so this is kind of where SNAP can kind of come in. Um, SNAP stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, and it's the nation's most important anti-hunger program. Uh, it's federally funded, um, and it provides for eligible individuals and families with a monthly benefit that they can use to buy food. It's done so on an EBT card, so much like a credit card, and every month it is um, refilled, so to speak, with the benefit amount. Um, SNAP is administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, but then also the state level um, runs at DPHHS, Department of Health and Human Services, um, and Office of Public Assistance also help oversee it here in the state level in Montana. Um, and SNAP, many folks, especially in the seniors, will know the program because it was previously known as food stamps. So why is SNAP so good and why is it a great alternative or a great uh, resource for seniors or anyone actually? Because um, it can improve your overall financial security by freeing up funds that you would be spending on food to apply for other bills or expenses, gas, rent, mortgage payments, so forth. 
Um, it also can help you allow you to save money. Um, and it also improves your food security by allowing you to know that you will have this money that can only be spent on food each month. You, you aren't going to have to give that up um, for an extra expense such as gas because SNAP money can only be used to purchase food. Um, some SNAP facts. Here's a, a couple more, some more data for you. Their uh, average SNAP benefit for a senior um, in 2015 that was living alone was $113 each month. And, you know, a little over 15% of elderly SNAP households received the minimum benefit, which last, well, in 2015, uh, was about $16 per month. And in 2016, it was about the same. Um, so a little over 9% also of all SNAP households had at least one person um, that was age 60 or older. And the biggest thing is that $171 million is the amount of revenue that uh, was pumped into Montana's economy by SNAP participation. In 2015, that number is likely to be a little bit higher for 2016. We don't have all of, all of those numbers in yet. Um, and although SNAP participation has increased dramatically across the U.S. and Montana um, since like 2000, from about 2006 to around 2014, 2015, um, in last year we saw Montana saw 120,000 um, residents that were receiving SNAP. However, less than 30% of all eligible seniors that are 60 or older um, are enrolled in SNAP. And this is a much, much lower number than our total state SNAP participation rate, which is about 77%. So um, there are a lot of eligible families that are enrolled in SNAP, but there are a lot of eligible seniors that just haven't um, kind of taken advantage, so to speak, of the program. Um, and the, why is this? Well, the important messages that we want to convey to seniors is that this is a program that you've paid into through your taxes. You've kind of bought into this program. You are more than, like, able and um, qualified to, to, to participate into it. So you're not taking money from anybody else. By enrolling in SNAP, you're not preventing somebody else from getting benefits. Um, you can also receive SNAP and still go to a food pantry or a senior center or meals on, you know, uh, through like a hot meal program. Um, that isn't limiting you to also being involved with, with those programs. Um, using the EBT card, it's a debit card, so it's easy and discreet and accepted at most major grocery stores um, across Montana and even some independently owned ones and is also in, um, being used at many farmers markets too in the summertime. So you can use it at a plethora of places. And more often than not, there is kind of, we hear uh, feedback that, well, if I'm only going to get $16 a month, what's the point? Um, most seniors qualify for more than the minimum amount. So we would always try to, to tell folks that are applying, you know, especially seniors, that this is the minimum amount, but you might be eligible for more. And I know there is often a, a mindset that, well, if it's just $16, that doesn't seem like a lot. Money rolls over from month to month, so if you don't use it all, it will be there the next month and it accumulates. And $16 is free bread and milk, you know, for a year when you think about it that way. That's free bread and milk for a month until that adds up. You wouldn't throw away a $16 coupon. So um, those are just some of the kind of messages that we, we like to remind folks of, especially if they're a little unsure or hesitant um, as to why they um, would enroll in SNAP. Um, and letting everyone know that there is more than enough um, money to go around so that they should, if they are eligible, please apply. Um, that kind of leads into who is eligible. Um, and the biggest thing, there are lots of different criteria in the SNAP world. Um, and so for most applicants, there is no longer a resource limit. Um, there are a bunch of categories, uh, expanded household categories that kind of get into the weeds a little bit about monthly incomes, but you'll see on this chart, um, it kind of talks to you about the, the gross monthly income limit for a person. This is up to 200% of the poverty line, and then the net monthly income limit. Um, and the little asterisk ne next to the gross monthly income limit is that um, some households with a previously disqualified member, that's someone who might have been on SNAP in the past and either um, their wages increased, so they kind of were ineligible, kind of rose above the SNAP income standards, um, or whatever the case 
may be. Um, so if they had a disqualified member, someone who was on SNAP but then was deemed ineligible and could no longer be on SNAP, they'll need to meet a lower gross income limit um, and subject, and they will be subject to a resource limit. Um, the lower income limit, I think, is 130% of the poverty line. Those guidelines are all um, online and actually in my next couple of slides, well, um, there's a great way online where you can kind of find out if you have any questions or doubts about income eligibility, how we can kind of um, go forward with that. Um, so I'm also going to say, um, for the purposes of this training, because it is a lot easier, we'll be looking at the online version of um, the SNAP application. It is very similar to Actually, it is pretty much identical to the paper application, but in the fact that the online application is a little easier um, in the fact that the paper application lists all of the questions, all of the information is nine pages long, um, and is a little harder to navigate because the, the benefit of online is if you answer no to a question, the, the internet, the online application automatically advances you to the next slide or the next page where you um, of eligible information that they need from you. The paper application doesn't. It lists everything that they could ever ask um, and you just kind of have to read line by line and know whether or not you or, or your clients um, should be filling that section out. So it is a little harder. Um, so for the purposes of just also it's easier to explain, we're going to be looking at the, the online application. I will say that when dealing with seniors, um, if time is ever an issue, the online application is um, really an easy tool. You can help them fill that out. You can fill it out for them. Um, the paper application, I would say, is more of a, a last resort unless you or someone else in, in your office could fill it out with them. Um, if the online application, if you don't have access to um, the internet or it is a very like it's not a good or solid internet connection, um, I would say the next best thing would be to have that you or your client call the um, the public assistance helpline in Helena. That number's at the very end of my presentation and I have it here too. Um, or even us and just have someone go over the, the application over the phone with your client. It, it will be a lot easier than reverting um, to the paper application in my opinion. But. Anyway, um, so like I said, you can find these online um, at www.apply.mt.gov. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this. It's on the Montana DPHHS website. Um, one box that I use at the beginning um, to kind of, if, if when folks call and they're asking for if they qualify for SNAP and how they can become enrolled in the program, is I use this little up in the top right-hand corner, this um, Am I Eligible box. And if you click on that, um, it brings up um, about six to ten questions that you plug in. They're very basic. They're all the information um, that your clients will have anyways and that we'll have to list later in the actual application. Just about income, household size, um, and a, you know, if they've been on SNAP before, date of birth, a couple of those things. Um, it's, it's really quick. It takes about maybe five minutes um, and then it will tell you at the end um, if, if what programs the, this applicant could be eligible for. If they're um, eligible for SNAP, you just come back here. Um, and if they're not, it will tell you, um, it'll list nothing or it might say just like uh, health coverage or something else. So if you ever have any doubt, oops, sorry about that. Um, like I said, use, utilize this little box. Um, but if you already know, if they tell you, you know, they have a very, very low um, net income or gross monthly income, um, if, if their income for a month is, you know, $800, they will likely qualify. I always tell all my clients, it's like, yes, um, it looks like you, you do qualify. Let's um, fill out an application. That doesn't necessarily guarantee that they will be getting money. It, I, never tell them approximately how much because I don't know that. I just say, let's get you an application. It looks like you will be eligible um, to be enrolled in this program. Um, and then from here, you um, will click on either apply now or sign in and create an account. Both of these buttons will eventually take you to the same place. So this is just like let your clients know, though, that you will need um, income and some resources, um, property and accounts. It's good to have a vague idea, even though, like we said earlier, most of them will not be subject to a resource limit. They um, will need 
some of that information just to fill out. And then definitely have their expenses, including rent or mortgage, utilities, if they can, um, and utilities, specifically heat, um, there's a big, there's a higher deduction um, for the utility allowance if uh, we, you can show or if they know how much they pay specifically out of the utility budget for heating and cooling of the home. You know, if they have any um, child or dependent care bills um, and medical costs are a big one. Um, and medical costs, we'll go over that a little bit more, but it's quite inclusive these days. So um, that's a big one just to, to let your clients know and if they can be thinking about or if they have records to show all of those different costs. Um, so this, when you hit uh, apply now, you will or sign in, log in, you will come to this page um, and you will need an ePath Montana account to apply for SNAP. This is, in my opinion, the hardest part of the whole application. So if you can get through this, you're going to be fine. Um, and I will tell you too, with the the application um, with seniors, if you're helping a senior fill it, filling it out online um, and this takes a while and you seem to get stuck or it's, it's not letting you register, I've had this happen, um, again, um, you're just here to help them. So feel free at some point if it's not advancing to just be like, you know what, let's just call that Montana Public Assistance Helpline or the Montana Food Bank Network. We're going to see if someone can help us with this. So also feel free, don't don't get bogged down and discouraged by this part. Um, and if it's not working out for you, by all means, pick up the phone and um, give us a call. Um, to do the ePass, if you're dealing with seniors, you will need a username and password, and to do a username, you will need an email account. Um, I have done this um, for seniors before, and they don't have an email account, so I just simply and literally make up an email. Um, the username you will need, do not use spaces, like if you use their name as a username, which I often do, say it's Bob Smith, I'll do Bob Smith. Um, but it doesn't like spaces um, in, you will often have to be like Bob Smith 1, Bob Smith 2. Um, and the passwords, you know, make sure they match, make sure, it's, make sure it's something kind of easy for you to remember and then feel free to write it down. The same with the email. Um, if you're creating an email just for the purposes of logging in, chances are you will not be coming back to a saved application um, or you won't be coming back to uh, the senior, your client won't be coming back to check their application status online. So it kind of becomes a moot point. Um, so but you just to let you know, you will have to create a username or password in the email. Feel free to make up an email. You will have to select a couple security questions um, and create those answers again. Um, that, like I said, that this is the hardest. This is the hardest part. But then, once you get all of that filled in, um, then you're in. Um, and so, this is what the first screen. Once you get in, kind of looks like applying for assistance. Um, and if you're only applying for SNAP, then the client has the right to submit the application with a very minimal information. We encourage you, um, if you're helping a client. Um, to, to get as much information as you possibly can because this can expedite the process and also will make the little um, the interview and the verification call that they have with DPHHS quicker. Um, it also helps out the folks at DPHHS. Um, so as much information as you can get in the application the first time, the better. Um, so from here, this just tells you like the basic screens, there's different kind of the things that you need that we already talked about. Um, and then you, when you always hit next on the bottom of the screen, um, this is the next one. I usually mark this, um, if you were helping a client, you would hit probably staff person or volunteer at an agency and it'll give you a drop down box to put your name, the agency you work with, and your address. Then after you get that done, you, it'll bring you up to this lovely screen um, and you can mark the programs um, that your client is applying for if they're applying for more than one. Um, so this is why it, we talk about the importance of so they don't have to fill out multiple applications. Um, use that pre-screening tool, that Am I Eligible box that I was talking about at the very beginning um, because this is where it will help you. Um, and maybe your client will only be eligible or is only interested in applying for SNAP, and that's great. But if in the event healthcare coverage assistance or TANF um, is a program that they are able to apply for or might be interested in, um, it's nice to know that beforehand. Um, so from them, then it's the opening screen, which is uh, about you, which is really about your client. Um, 
And basic stuff, the important thing on this screen is that if uh, your client doesn't have a permanent address, um, that's fine, but it's necessary for the purposes of SNAP to have a mailing address in order to receive the notices. Um, they can use an address for a family member, friend, church, um, senior center, anywhere that they have arranged to get their mail. Um, also, you will know that there is a chance your clients, um, especially as the age, that they might, where they live and their mailing address might be two different locations. Again, that's fine. Just be sure to note that um, and, and make sure that their, whatever address you're putting down for your mailing address is one that they check um, because they will receive information um, and that's where they'll be their EBT card is mailed to them, so um, you just want to let them know that whatever they put for the mailing address is one that they need to have access to and be checking. Um, so the expedited service, um, this really comes up just if you, um, if a, a, your client has, is, has a very low net income, um, they will they can qualify for expedited service, as you can see, if they have their income is less than $150 and they have no more than $100 in cash and savings. Their combined income and resources um, are less than the rent and mortgage and utilities that they pay. Um, and we can probably, or they're a destitute migrant and seasonal farm worker. Um, if you plug this stuff into the box, when you mark it down, it will just advance you to the next the next slide or um, it will just say, oh, no worries. So when you come to the, then if you advance to the next one, we'll go through household members for seniors. Um, this application is really nice because it is, um, usually there's just one or two people in the home. Sometimes there are more, um, but it goes pretty quickly uh, because there are less smaller household like dependents and, and child information that they have to enter. Um, this is something that, that the definition of a household, when we do say household for SNAP purposes, are, are people who live together, purchase, and prepare food together. Um, if you have uh, several clients, say you have a client who is, has a roommate um, or another person, that just because there are two people in that home or housing unit um, doesn't make them a household necessarily. If, if they view themselves as a household or if they buy all of their groceries and prepare all of their me meals together, they're a household. Um, but just because two people are living at the same address doesn't mean you have to put two people um, as household members on the SNAP application if that makes sense. I've helped um, several people with applications who are in roommate situations, um, but they are still just a household of one, even though there are other people that live in that house. They don't prepare food together, they don't shop together, etc. cetera. Um, and then here again, you'll mark, there's some repetition as far as things that you will enter multiple times. Uh, usually sometimes the client's date of birth comes up once or twice. Um, and then it's important to note their place of birth um, and so forth. And then here, once again, you'll select the, um, the program selection. Um, so if you're just, it might come already pre-marked, um, but if it doesn't, just make sure that you're marking that all of the programs you want to apply for are marked. Um, you will need the, your client's social security number. Um, and then just, I always ask, you know, if they've ever had a different social security number to include. Um, then from this screen, when you fill it all out, and this is how many people are your home, and that's like what, I, what I was saying earlier about household members. Um, it's just, again, asking how many people, you know, are in their household. So the, the wording on are in your home can, can, get a little, uh, can get a little confusing for some. Um, then you will go on to the, kind of talks a little bit about the um, earned income. Um, and there's always a little progress bar, so you can always be checking at the top if your clients are kind of getting um, a little anxious about how long it's taking. I do tell folks that it takes to fill it out online until you go through all of the information, and depending on how fast the internet is, um, it takes about 30 minutes. So you should plan on about a half an hour um, to help someone. Sometimes it can go faster, sometimes it can be a little bit longer, but just at the beginning I always tell them it takes about 30 minutes so that they are aware. Um, otherwise it, it can be long if they're just like waiting around and trying to give you information and, and not really sure, um, you know, if this is normal or not. Um, 
they'll ask for current or new jobs or past jobs. Um, and by past jobs, it's really stopped working in the last 60 days. So if someone has been retired for five, 10 or more years, um, you don't really have to worry about that. Um, Self-employment box, those kinds of things. Um, if they have a current job, here is where you enter that information. The drop-down box right here, they list a bunch of like full-time, part-time. Um, I think there's one for like migrant farm working, et cetera. Um, and again, it talks about it just a lot for the last 60 days. So you can mark yes or no just based on, and some of this, if you know the person, you can easily be filling in for them and they might not even be questions um, that you have to spend a lot of time going over. Um, if there is no earned, uh, this is part about earned income that will have to be verified um, through pay stubs, um, but if pay stubs are unavailable, um, the client during their interview slash verification with a caseworker at DPHHS, um, they can discuss, you know, other, other options how, how that will be verified. Um, and if they um, are self-employed, they will need business records or tax information, et cetera, to verify the income. Um, here is where a lot of seniors, this is the form that a lot of the seniors will have information for. Um, so a lot of them are retired or haven't been working in the last 60 days. Um, this is going to be where a lot of their, their SSI, Social Security benefits, if they have veterans benefits or anything like that, um, this is where it comes into play. Um, so we'll ask about money from other sources and unearned income includes any household income um, from any source of, of employ any source other than employment. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is where if they have a disability, anything like that, workers comp. Um, there is a section later on, I don't think it's under here, where if they do get money from some sort of settlement or lawsuit, that is recorded, um, but not on this page. Um, after you enter in which sources they get from unearned income, um, it'll take you to the expenses. Um, and they your clients will receive deductions for eligible expenses. And these help um, meet that net income guidelines and that chart at the very beginning that we were talking about. And that is what helps determine the amount that they get in benefits. So um, expenses must be verified to count as deductions. And this is one of the questions that in the verification call slash interview, um, the DPHHS caseworker will ask. Um, the most common expenses that kind of qualify are rent or mortgage, any sort of housing cost, utility expenses, particularly like I was talking about earlier, heat. Um, if they pay a rent that is all inclusive with utilities, um, it, it would be beneficial if you can ask your clients if they can talk to their landlord to see if, if their landlord can write out a letter or statement to qualify how much of, of your client's rent the landlord puts towards heat, um, just because that's a, a good way to um, help them get the most from their, their deductions and get more in their benefit amount for SNAP. Um, like uh, utility expenses, child care, adult care, and medical expenses um, are a big one. Um, the medical expenses, this is, we'll get to in a second, this is just more of what, when you list out the utilities, it'll ask you to break it out. So here's where it would be nice if, um, if they tell you, you know, a lot of people um, here in Western Montana, it's uh, Northwestern Energy, and so the the bill, you know, just kind of lumps them together. So they play they pay this amount. Um, you can separate it out if it's natural gas and um, electricity, or natural gas. Um, and you know, say they have a lump sum that's just like, well, it's both of these things. You can kind of separate it out as you want. Um, split it in half if you can't tell right on the bill. Again, that's not um, a huge deal. The caseworker is going to see the bill when they verify it and they can adjust accordingly. Um, make sure, you know, if they get water or garbage, sewer, anything like that, um, they are, there is a basic phone rate, so if a senior has a landline, make sure that they're including their telephone bill um, or their installment fee in that as well. Um, and here's where it's also important to show that if the utilities are included in your rent, um, see if you can get a statement or something from the landlord saying how much out of the actual rent amount that they charge they use for utilities. Um, and whoops, I went too far. 
Um, there, and then there are other expenses that go into consideration too, just other bills uh, like legally obligated child support payments, probably not a huge dem issue for this demographic. Dependent care bills could be, um, so it's any bill that they pay to care for a child or an adult with a disability or another elderly person that's living in the home, um, this could actually be including themselves. Um, and then the Medicare Part A or Part B or Advantage Plan or Drug Plan. Um, so if they have any medical expenses, um, deductibles, including co-pays, premiums, all of those things, you will want to capture though that. Um, and it is pretty extensive as far as the things that they will count as medical expenses. Um, if your client or a senior has a therapy dog, um, they will include, although it will have to be noted as far as like a doctor's um, write-up that this dog, this pet is in, in fact for therapy. Um, but I think then it includes food and vet visits for that animal, but it also includes if your client is um, has to travel to go to the doctor's office, making sure that the gas to get to those doctor's offices is included. Um, any prescription drugs, hospital, previous um, medical expenses, if they have a wheelchair, like the cost of the wheelchair, any maintenance, um, the same with walkers or prosthetics or anything of that nature. So really it's, it's, it's pretty inclusive. Um, so as you're sitting there with your clients, anything that they can think of or that you know, um, just make, make a note about it. And if they're not sure of the cost of that, um, again, just write it down. There is a section at the very end, um, if you're not sure if something would be included or not, there's a section at the very end of the application, which we will get to, um, a note section, and you can add in information that you can, you know, have the caseworker look into or that you weren't sure if it was covered but wanted to make sure that it was mentioned at least. So get as much of it as you can um, under the, the medical expenses, but again, don't panic if uh, you, you're not sure where something fits in, but you think it could be relevant. Just make a note of it and um, be sure to include it at the end. Um, your clients on the authorized representative um, can select someone to help them with their case. This could be a friend, a family member with seniors, depending on um, if they're experiencing any sort of memory loss or if they are maybe at a point where they're in charge of, of most of their finances and so forth but have um, other like powers of attorney or whatever, they are allowed to authorize someone else to help them with their case. Here's also where I um, will mark my own information if I um, am just helping them. So I will often hear mark that I'm helping apply for SNAP um, and that I'm just helping them apply for benefits. Um, and then I always mark that I, you know, that the client has allowed me to um, view the above data, obviously, because I typed it all in. Um, and then usually for these last two questions, I always mark no for me. However, if a client, because you um, are, it's a senior population that you all work with, has designated another, you know, authorized representative such as a friend or family member to actually help them kind of maintain the EBT card or help with the records and that, you will want to put that person's name here. Um, and then I would also mark off the, you know, access to your Montana SNAP account. Um, and then maybe even that's, or maybe it's receiving all letters and notifications or to discuss um, my case with the department. If you are, have a senior who is having some um, memory loss or, or cognitive um, delays or cognitive functioning problems um, and you think that a if they were to chat with a caseworker, it would be very confusing for them or they might not be able to answer all of the questions, feel free to see if your client would um, provide you with the name of a person to, to be an authorized representative. And then I would definitely also mark that discuss my case um, with the department so that you know that your client is being advocated for um, and is, is getting as much, you know, as much information as they need um, and that DPHHS is getting as much information as they need from your client. So um, that can even be you, depending again, like I said, on all of your uh, caseloads and so forth. Um, it's it's up to you, but I would bring that up to your client and see um, you know best if that that would be a viable or a better option for them to have an authorized representative. <laughs> You're getting close to the end by this point. Um, you have there. Uh, 
the final steps, um, as you go through this application, I didn't take screenshots because that would double the screenshots. Um, after every section, when you go to advance, um, it will bring up, it'll let you review. Um, so it essentially will, if you hit next, um, it'll almost bring up the same screen again and you'll look at it uh, if you're like me when I first did my online application. Um, and I said, I just filled out this page. Why do I have to do it again? Um, and it's not so much that you forgot something or didn't fill out a section. It's just allowing you an opportunity um, to think about it and in case you forgot to add a person, usually under dependence um, or expenses. It's like if all of a sudden you're looking at that sheet and you're like, oh, right, I totally forgot to fill in what I paid for water. You can do it on that screen. So in order to ever get to the next section, you'll have to hit next twice. So read your headings. Know that you know that's why it's bringing you back after you you know after you try to advance the screen the first time. It's not taking you back, it's just like letting you know, kind of giving you that opportunity to review and make sure that you didn't want to add anything else um, before you go to the next slide or the next page on the application. Um, and again, something that um, I keep in mind and tell all of my clients and definitely want to remind you that um, if you can't capture everything or having trouble deciphering something from your client or getting certain information or aren't sure about it, it's okay. I mean, you're as soon as this is submitted, um, it, it gets into the system, um, and then it becomes DPHHS and the Office of Public Assistance is, it falls on their radar, and then they will be calling your client, which they're going to have to do anyway, to kind of verify some of the um, particulars to help figure out the benefit amount um, before they award the SNAP benefits. Um, we call it an interview. Sometimes it's kind of confusing, so I just tell folks that, you know, someone from the Office of Public Assistance or DPHHS will be calling them to just verify some of this information, et cetera. Those uh, interviews take about 20 minutes um, when DPHHS calls, um, unless, of course, there is a large section of the application that's left blank. It might take longer. It might be less time, but roughly around 20 minutes. Um, and they ask very specific questions, usually targeted towards income and expenses. Um, if you have a lot of medical expenses, I'm guessing that um, your clients will receive some questions in that area, and they will have to provide some um, verification. The good news is for seniors, if they are receiving, you know, Social Security or SSI or SSDI or veterans benefits, um, the DPHHS workers can generally look up that information in their computers and their, their sharing systems. Um, so it's a little bit faster than providing paper copies or faxed copies to them. But back to this page, um, you're close to the end. There are some rights and responsibilities that you have to, you know, read to your client, make sure they understand that the information they provided to you that you put on this application is as accurate as they, um, you know, as accurate as, as, they, as it can be. Um, they know that you're helping them apply for benefits. They know what these benefits can be used for. Um, they know that someone from DPHHS or the Office of Public Assistance will be contacting them um, for an interview once this is submitted, um, and that they're going to be honest and truthful and provide that person with it, as much information as they can. Um, I usually paraphrase this part when reading it to my clients because most of them, we've, we've talked about all of the things that this asks about. Um, but just letting them know and all of them are like, yes, sure. Um, after that kind of the legalese comes, uh, after you talk about the rights and responsibilities, it comes the legal disclaimer. Um, and this is, again, just kind of reminding them that they know um, SNAP can only be used for food. They can't share their EBT card with anyone. Um, if they're approved, they will have to do, they will have to verify their income and they will be subject to like recertification rules. We'll get to that in a minute for seniors. They don't have to recertify as often um, as households of working adults or with children, um, but they do still have to recertify if any of their income changes. They need to let them know that. Um, so this is important to just like briefly go through. If you need to paraphrase it, you can. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> um, and then here it's important to note to your clients 
that you will be having an interview um, for SNAP or actually or TANF, any of the programs that they applied for. Um, Usually it's over the phone and it's with a case manager who works for the Department of Health and Human Services or Office of Public Assistance. Um, and that they will be contacted, your client will be contacted by those offices about that interview. Um, and then here is the box that I was talking about um, for other information. It's your opportunity to add any other relevant information that you think um, or you want to bring to the caseworker's attention. For instance, things that I've included here. Um, I had a client once who had a phone but wasn't always working, but his, so his neighbor um, allowed him to use her phone. So I put, you know, here or in the application, the two phone numbers to reach him at, and I made a note here, like, if you call this number and a woman answers, it's John's neighbor. You know, or here's a great place to put, um, my client has some, um, bills relating to like a wheelchair repair or anything that you couldn't plug in elsewhere or might have forgot or missed and later on remembered, oh my goodness, I forgot to ask about this one expense or something, be sure to include it here. Um, the case managers do read this and it is helpful. Um, or if you if you have a question or think that there, um, there wasn't a good spot under resources to list this, I've had folks who have had some um, interesting partially um, self-employed businesses, um, farms where they owned a farm, but then they had pretty much were renting out the, the land and so forth, and just some odd things that I, I would make notes of here for case managers to review. Um, a note, it does not like you, it does not allow you to tab down to create paragraphs, like new paragraphs. You just have to keep it in one consistent paragraph. If you try to take a space in between um, your paragraphs in this other information section, like to make it grammatically correct or just visually appealing, it will not allow you to continue um, when you go to hit submit or next screen. I have learned that many times. Um, so now you are really almost done, um, and this is a part of your signature declaration um, for your client. Um, by checking the box, you know, you certify that. Type in your client's name here. There is another box that will be right below this um, that if you have a prepare or have someone helping you basically. So I always mark this box, put in the client who I've helped, their name, then there's a box below it that I mark as well, and then I put in my name. Um, and then you will hit submit. And this says that as soon as you hit submit, the application is sent electronically um, to the Office of Public Assistance for processing. Um, and then the client will still need to submit, like we said, some verifications and complete the phone interview, but they'll be contacted um, by DPHHS. Um, and then after, from there, that is pretty much your, uh, your online application. It, it does come up after you hit that submit button. Um, it will give you a, uh, like a tracking number, which you can write down. For seniors, if they're not going to be checking or tracking online or you, you're not doing it for them, um, it, it doesn't necessarily matter, but it is it can be helpful, especially um, if you haven't heard anything and you need to contact DPHHS or um, the Office of Public Assistance about the application, it is helpful to just write down that number just to reference it and you say, I, I submitted this application, can you tell me what happened to it? application T269, whatever, whatever it could be. Um, so some things, once that is submitted, it goes off, um, and, but your clients, they will have to have the interview, um, and this is done, often done by phone. Um, your clients can follow up, although depending on the location, in the last week or so I've been hearing very, very good things about um, DPHHS and OPA getting, or o, yeah, OPA getting back to folks for their interviews like within 24 hours. I had two clients within the last week. Um, I submitted their applications in the afternoon and by 9 a.m. the following day, um, they had been contacted um, about their SNAP applications. So um, if your clients don't hear anything, um, and it's you know two to three business days, feel free to follow up. They can follow up by calling um, this 888 number is the Montana Public Assistance Helpline. And that's also the number that if um, for any reason, if you're filling it out, out the application online, the internet freezes, it won't let you sign in, it won't let you advance. Um, these are all issues that I've experienced while helping clients. Um, you can always 
pause, tell your client, you're like, hey, how about we, what if we just call this helpline or refer your client to call this helpline. Um, they'll do the application over the phone and then that often will constitute as their interview as well. So it can expedite the process a little quicker. This because it is the Montana Public Assistance, like all public assistance helpline, um, it can be busy. Um, so that is just something to note. The wait times for that number can be, um, can be a little challenging. Um, and then once enrolled in SNAP, senior and disabled households that have no earned income, um, so if they're getting all of their income from SSI or um, SSDI, they're certified for uh, two years, more or less. Um, and with, with change reporting requirements, which just means they only need to report if their um, income changes and brings them above that 130% of the poverty line, which for the most part is seniors are not going to have to deal with. Um, but they're most for regular house or households with adults and children, I think the reporting requirement is you have to do it once every six months to a year, so seniors have a little bit longer um, of a gap time before they have to do that. Um, and they can update their information anytime if they move or, you know, um, they're moving from, say, their home in with a family member or friend. Um, it will be important to just make sure that the information that the Office of Public Assistance has on file is correct, especially for mailing, just because you don't want um, something comes up, they send your client a letter, um, your client doesn't live at that address anymore, you don't want it to get lost in the mail, and then the client, um, potentially their SNAP benefits can, you know, get get cut off or whatever. So just make sure, let your clients know that if, if anything like that changes, especially in their physical residence or a mailing address, um, to just call that 888 number um, and they can, get, they can get it updated. So now that we've kind of walked you through the, the nitty gritty of SNAP applications, um, kind of what's next for all of you, um, we greatly, greatly appreciate you sitting in on this webinar. We greatly appreciate the work that you're doing in your communities and counties um, with the seniors and, and the elderly population. Um, and so if you would like, some other ways that you can help us with this, SNAP is such an important program and a great way for um, seniors to have access to food. Um, we have a plethora of information on it. So if you, um, we are more than happy to provide outreach materials um, to you in your office and answer any questions. Um, and you're also more than welcome to refer your clients to the Montana Food Bank Network for assistance. Um, whether it, this is through SNAP or some of our other programs, we are hoping um, to be getting some funding and then looking for other agencies to help us as um, food box sites um, for seniors. Um, and we'll be keeping you all up to date about that. Um, and or you can also offer SNAP assistance at your office um, or with your clients. Um, that's a really simple thing to do and helps us out um, because then we just simply ask you to sign a program agreement and then every month send me an email with how many completed SNAP applications you did. Um, and then we use that number and A, turn that data into this, the state and the federal um, for our federal SNAP money and report, and then we also turn it into Feeding America, which we are a member of, um, which is a nonprofit version of the National Hunger Fighting um, Organization. And so that just better gives us a glimpse, an overall glimpse of like how we're doing in Montana, how this outreach effort is going, how many people we're reaching. Um, and we're really hoping that we can bring up that number from the 30% of eligible seniors are enrolled in SNAP in Montana to a much higher number, especially as the population of Montana is aging. So if you're interested in any of that, um, I, uh, feel free to email me or give me a call. My number and email will be appearing in just a moment, um, and we can get you set up with that. Some other just kind of quick things that might be beneficial, um, clients can check their SNAP balance and view their transactions um, online, or there is a different 866 number that they um, can call, um, and they'll just need the number on the card. Um, if, you're, if clients aren't sure where they can use SNAP in their area, there is a great website, snaprietailerlocator.com. Um, but like I said, most major retail grocery stores across the state accept it. Um, and there are farmers markets now that are more and more that are accepting SNAP, so that's a great tool. The farmersmarkets.mt.gov website um, is continually being updated. And with seniors, some of them will do double SNAP dollars, which means if you spend $20 in groceries, or in like fresh produce at the farmer's market, you'll get $20 free, and some of them are very specific to just seniors. I believe it's in 
polls. And, um, so, but check that out, and that'll have great information about other resources on SNAP, um, and especially for accessing fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and now uh, is the time. I'm a little over, sorry, but we still have some time for questions. Um, and so, Amy, well, Rachel, if you want to go ahead and unmute the phones. Um, okay. Folks, I if you have, have any, two, I do have two oh, questions already. Perfect. So we could start with those, and then we all yeah. unmute everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first one, there's actually three. There's the first one I'll address. Um, is the presentation going to be an email to everyone? Um, it will be available on our website, and we'll also let Elizabeth know so she can also email it out to everyone. That's yeah. the first one. <laughs> and then um, the next question is. After an online application is submitted, do applicants wait until they are contacted from DPHHS to mail income verification, or do we have to mail that out to them immediately? That is a great question. Um, I would say that don't mail, um, wait until you are contacted by DPHHS, because a lot of times for seniors, if it is online, they will actually not likely have to physically provide the verification because it's on a computer um, and the DPHHS will be able to access that. So a lot, depending on the situation of the senior, um, I would I would tell your clients once you submit the application to wait on verifying anything, like mailing anything to Helena, um, until you have have chatted then with a caseworker just because they're, they might ask you to verify more things than you had mailed. They might ask you to verify some different things. So um, I would, my strongest suggestion would be to just wait until you talk to that caseworker before you put anything in the mail um, to verify. Okay. And then um, I have another question. Who is offering this in Yellowstone County, County aka Billings? Okay. Um, who is offering this in Billings? Um, we have one of our trained partner agencies, um, Family Service um, Services Inc. Inc. Is uh, they have done the training and they also um, do SNAP application assistance. So if you're in the Billings area, um, they are one that does offer it. Um, you're, I don't have their phone number right in front of me, but if you look up Family Services Inc. Um, or I can send it to you afterwards. Um, I would call them. Again, I'm not sure. Sometimes the days and times may vary. Um, and also, any of your local um, Office of Public Assistance is like the local Office of Public Assistance. You can clients can go into. They can um, fill out the, either a paper application or talk to someone there apply and get their interview. So um, those are, and, and that goes across the board. That's not even just in Billings. That's any community that you live in. Okay, I have another question. Um, if an adult child, 23, lives with her parents, does the application have to list the parents and the child buys her own food? Can you repeat that question? Yeah. Um, it says, if an adult child, 23, lives with her parents and does the application have to list the parents if the child buys her own food? If the child buys her own food and is like for the, again, those purposes of household members, you know, if, if, she's, um, if she's buying her own food and if, you know, she might be paying a little rent, but she's, although she is their child, she is independent, but just maybe like living there because she's attending school or college, um, I would say she, those, those would be two different household units. For the purposes of SNAP, if she um, is preparing her own, purchasing and preparing her own meals, um, or they are purchasing food and preparing their own meals, although they might live under the same roof, um, for that purpose, it would be two different, two different applications. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. Um, again, if you want yourself muted, you can do that on the WebEx control panel with the little icon. Um, it takes a few seconds, but um, then everyone can speak if they have questions. Hi, this is Jessica Davies from Sydney, Montana. Hey, I was wondering, first of all, can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. I was wondering, going back to the verification, um, mm -hmm. two parts to that. One. If they do have, to, you're kind of saying that if they did things online, they wouldn't necessarily have to send in verification. Is that because we would scan and and, and input the information, the documents ahead of time, or kind of confused nope. on that? Yep. Kind of no, that, 
<laughs> that is a great question. I'm sorry, that was a, my bad on explaining it. If you do the application online, uh, I had a question earlier that said if, if you submit an application online, in the meantime, as soon as it's submitted, should clients go ahead and send their pay stubs, copies of their pay stubs or whatever, um, to, to the OPA office for verification? And I said, no, don't do that. If you And also, if you fill out the application online to your question, you can't upload those verification documents. Um, my, my point about um, verifying is that you will likely have to verify some information. However, if a senior, if it's a senior household or any household that's just collecting things like SSI and SSDI, chances are their verification, um, they won't necessarily have to physically submit, whether it's scan or send, because a lot of times DPHHS can access those federal databases um, and verify it on their computer almost instantaneously. Um, so I would say for, as far as the verification goes, as on the client's end, um, they will talk, when their caseworker contacts them, um, then they will be asked, you know, if there is information that the caseworker has not been able to access and verify, um, your client then will be. But you can't actually submit any documents um, and upload them on the app, on the online application. I hope, does that clarify? Or is that, that only further? Okay, sorry. <laughs> and so the, the next part of that is that, so what we are looking at doing is utilizing our volunteers um, through the RSVP program. Mm -hmm. so to reach out and sit down with a lot of our clients and get them signed up for this type of program because they don't mm -hmm. feel comfortable going into um, sure. the Office of Public Assistance or whatnot. Sure. I know you talked about that they can have they can uh, they can check the box to have somebody kind of do the follow up, but the follow up part is the key to that. And so, I mean, is it okay that you have? say volunteers that they have identified that can help them with all of the follow-up to all of this? I mean, it's making sure that we're closing the gap or, or right. closing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. And the authorized representative, I think that's the what the part that you're talking about. Um, and it's it's mostly, especially if it's a senior that is, um, say, like they might not have great access, uh, like phone access, that or be, be able to be reached that often. Um, and so the authorized representative, it's more or less just telling DPHHS that, and the letting you know the client if they feel more comfortable, like, say they are uncomfortable if they've had maybe a previous instance with someone um, who's at the local office of public assistance. It's just saying that this authorized representative is in touch with the client, um, knows the client, and can speak on their behalf, you know, accurately and and, um, and has access to if that verification is needed for, for certain incomes and so forth. Um, this person can also act on the client's behalf if the client is, you know, unable to um, or just might need a little extra explanation. Um, so I would think that that would be be fine um, as for your authorized representative, but it would be something that your client and your volunteers might need to work out um, and might be more of a, a, a legalese question you might actually want to check with the Office of Public Assistance like in Helena on just to see like on their, on their level. I mean, for, to cover your bases because you would hate to like have that happen, you know, fill out a bunch of, um, of those applications and then there be, there be an issue with it. But. And don't get me wrong, I want to, I got to make this statement that we're not, it's not um, just volunteers out there willy-nilly. <laughs> right, no, no, I agree. And I know the RSV program and they are vetted, so, but, you know, so I, that, in that regards, that's why I said I don't foresee that as being an issue, but um, I, I might double check at just one more higher level, like at DPHHS since they are the issuing entity. Um, and that's, to be fair, and one more thing, thank you for drawing that to my attention, um, and I know we're getting close to time, so I'll be brief in case there are more questions, to let your clients know that, and I always let my clients know that it's like, I, I'm not the one, I don't have a stack of EBT cards here, I can't issue them, I can't, um, you know, so although I think that, that you, um, they're eligible, you know, it does reside, the final decision does come down um, to the state, and so it's like you can help people, and you're trying to make sure that they have as much access as needed. Um, but in the end, yeah, it comes down, and I and that you don't work for the state either is always another important thing to the state in DPHHS sense. Right. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Let's, if we don't, I know we're a little over time. So, any yeah. final? Oh, I got a question. Uh, my name is yeah. Jake Sorch. I'm here in Great Falls. I'm a SHIP counselor with Cascade County Aging Services. 
And and my question is, what? I guess I'm a little con and maybe so. I apologize. Maybe this isn't having to do with the application, but so what do I tell people who come in and say I'm worried I'm going to be losing my SNAP benefits? You know, I see that they're cutting the budget, and I don't know what to do about. I'm, I'm just people are worried about that they're going to be losing stuff. What I guess what what would you suggest I I, I tell them? Well, um, first of all, I would tell them that. Um, there's nothing cut yet, so for now they they have their their SNAP benefits, um, and unless they are, are notified of a difference, um, that they will still be receiving them. So tell them, in, you know, to keep on using them. Um, if it if it comes down and they are um, and it is announced, you know, in state, federal, whatever, um, I would say the next best thing for them, although it it you know if they are cut. Unfortunately, that's one of those things. The best thing is, is we talk about this here sort of to an, an advocacy, let them know that, you know, this is a great time to, um, to reach out to maybe their elected officials um, or in their community um, to let them know that, they, that this helps them a great, a great deal. This is how they survive um, and that by cutting this in program um, and if they lost their SNAP benefits, that that would be detrimental um, to their budget and, you know, their ability to eat. So for the folks, you know, try to reassure them and say, for now, you know, unless you've heard differently, just just keep using your EBT. But if for folks that um, it is it is a very real um, concern, um, just say, you know, and, and I know we, we here are working on that, trying to protect uh, kind of the, the SNAP budget and keep those cuts from happening, but it is a collective effort. So if you have clients that come in that are willing to, um, reaching out to their elected officials um, in support of that program would be an excellent opportunity um, and a great way to just help ensure that the more voices we can get out there um, and the more pro-SNAP, being pro that SNAP is working and helps families that need it um, is, is great message and a great tool to use. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have one more question in the chat box, and it's probably our last one. Perfect. Um, but it says, I work with the LIEAP program, Low Income oh, yeah. Energy Assistance Program. Our clients automatically qualify for assistance if they are SNAP eligible. My question is, do the SNAP caseworkers know that fact? And if so, are they referring each client to our program? Um, they, the the SNAP caseworkers should, um, because they are often, especially at the verification, that's why when we list out heat is such a big thing and during this application, um, the caseworkers at Office of Public Assistance, I have been told um, and, and would maybe right, like wrongfully sort of in some ways assume that they are cross-trained um, to include all of the programs, but that is I, one of the big reasons why we trotted, we meaning myself and, and folks that I, that I do this training with on SNAP application assistance, to draw attention to the spessing out the, the HEAT program. There really isn't a question on the application about um, the LIEP program, um, but making sure that um, I would mention that if someone is on LIEP, that would be another great thing to, again, just put in that other section up the, on the application. Um, and then, the case, like you said, the caseworkers should be doing the cross-referring at the DPHHS level. Elizabeth? Okay. Yes. This is Carrie with the Office on Aging. And Hi. I just wanted to add that um, the ADRCs out there, the Area Agencies on Aging, Yes. Um, nine of the ten now are ADRCs and can help, I mean, they do help with SNAP applications. And awesome. three of our ADRCs are now BECs under a National Council on Aging grant. Uh -huh. And the SNAP is one of the core benefits that we're focusing on in those three areas. And that's Area 5 out of Butte, Area 6 out of Polson, and Area 9 out of Kalispell. Great. Great. So that's happening. I just wanted you to know. Thank you so much. That's great information to have. You bet. Thank you. Well, I, yes, no, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's been on the call. Um, I think that we have to wrap it up. But um, we will be posting the webinar and the recording, uh, and it will have the slides in PDF form on um, the, the RDI website, and we will be, I will be sending out a link um, with that information. Um, if any of you have questions, um, please, please, please feel free to email me um, or give me a call. My uh, phone number and email are right there. Um, and uh, I will hope to be in touch with 
some of you soon, and hopefully if any of you are interested in um, working with us and offering these trainings at your office, we'd love to, to chat more. So uh, I look forward to talking to some of you again soon in the future, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.